Welcome everyone to the Sustainability in Rural and Community Hospitals from Health Recon Connect. I'm Julie Haleska, and I am the Vice President of Enterprise Sales at Health, Re Health Recon Connect. I have been past president of HFMA of San Diego, and I've been in the revenue cycle space for over 20 years. It's my pleasure to also introduce Chris Joyner and Clint Owen. Chris? Hi, thank you, Julie. My name is Chris Joyner. I'm the Chief Consulting Officer at Health Recon Connect. I have about 35 years of revenue cycle experience, mostly focused in critical access areas. Um, I'm generally focused on uh, hospital turnaround situations. I also am a past president of the HFMA Lone Star Chapter and currently on the HFMA uh, Region 9 Board. Clint? Yeah, thanks, Chris and Julie. Um, yeah, good to be with everyone. Uh, Clint Owen, I am the VP of Enterprise Sales as well and I covered the Texas region as well as central United States uh, in supporting of rural community hospitals as well as big health systems. Uh, myself, I, I'm a past president of, of HFMA South Texas chapter as well as past uh, regional executive for HFMA for region nine. Um, 34 years experience working predominantly like Chris in a lot of the rural community space uh, in Texas and some other uh, surrounding states. Uh, predominantly, I've been selling um, uh, revenue cycle support services to, to those that have a need for outsourcing. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it back to Julie, and we'll, we'll get this conversation started. And, and please don't hesitate. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We'll address them as we see them. And uh, looking forward to a great conversation and, and session. Thank you. Thank you, Clint. And thank you, Chris. Welcome, everyone. Today, we're gonna to talk a little bit about our current state of rural and US community hospitals. We're gonna talk about national shortages. We're gonna talk about state specific things. What's happening in your state specifically? And we're gonna talk about staffing turnover and has the pandemic actually caused this shortage? We're gonna talk about other viable short-term and long-term options. And then we're gonna talk a little bit about our revenue cycle services from HRC. As you can tell here from the map, um, that the darker shades are really where you have a huge need for resources. And as you can tell, the whole United States needs to have some help here. We are suffering throughout the country. California alone is down 30% in staffing shortages. And that includes not just nurses, but also frontline, all departments of the hospital are suffering, as you know. You know, staffing shortages um, based upon this ECRI, um, it's actually saying that it's jeopardizing patient safety. And you know why it is? And, and this, this um, blip from ECRI said staffing, pay, and lack of support were top factors. And that's why 32% of nurses in uh, patient care positions are indicating they were gonna leave their roles. And that was in 2021. And I'm sure that number has gotten bigger, but this is the same for our hospital staff and patient access, patient financial services. And as I said, all of the um, different areas of the hospital departments. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Clint, take a look at this slide. Yeah, th thanks Julie. And um, you know, this is, we put this slide in there, uh, you know, not knowing who the audience was going to be and how long you've been in healthcare. But, you know, these shortages and, and, and concerns and issues that we're all dealing with within healthcare didn't just pop up in the last two to five years, right? It's been going on for an extended period of time. And predominantly, uh, you know, it was physician driven, shortage of physicians and nurses. Uh, as this um, slide depicts from the American Hospital Association back in 2005, you see a pretty good uh, uh, slice of the pie here. Registered nurses, you know, made up the biggest bulk of, of, of shortages. Then it goes nursing assistants and it goes all the way down, as you see there. And it, I know it's a little fuzzy, but it goes down to the pharmacy level. So we've been combating, you know, this shortage in all facets of healthcare for a very long time. And, and you know, to Julie's point on the, the, the United States map that she showed in the different colorings, you know, I was able to pull down uh, some additional information and I'll just highlight Florida as an example. You, and, and Julie mentioned the nursing piece of it. Florida is experiencing the greatest that they've ever seen in, in shortages. Um, they're up to vacancy rates of 21%. That's a 10% increase from 2021. 
compared to nationally of a, a 7% increase uh, of vacancies from 2021, their um, turnover rate has, has grown exponentially. I mean, it's 32% up seven, almost 8% from 2021. Whereas globally, if you cross the United States, we're seeing that at a 27% rate and up 8% uh, nationally uh, on turnover rates. So it's, it's a big problem. And, and as I stated, this 32% for Florida, just as an example, is the highest turnover rate that they've ever experienced in, in, in Florida. So again, that's just one state that we're, that we're highlighting there. And we've got some other examples that we'll kind of get into a little bit. But um, yeah, it, it's, um, it's been going on. I think it's been exacerbated, obviously, since uh, you know, February, March of 2020 when the pandemic hit. Uh, but Julie, why don't you go on to the next slide? No, I'll kind yeah. of touch on that. Um, you know, it, it, this is a great little blip here, you know, blurb about hospital employment overall is down 95 plus thousand from the pre-pandemic pre levels. And, you know, and because I've covered a lot of the rural space in my 34 years, I've kind of, as I thought back when we're talking about putting this together, when I've made my on-site visits and meetings to meet with with the business office uh, area and the CFO, C-suite area, you know, you kind of take a look around when you're meeting some of the team members at these real community hospitals. And, you know, and I'll just say up 30 years ago, met some of these folks. Well, I go back today and the same people are still there. Now, that's a good and a bad uh, situation. It's good because you have tenure, you have consistency in the processes and such like that. Uh, but it's bad because if they're at the age, my age or a little older, they're looking to roll out from, from a retirement standpoint. Or, and, and unfortunately, you know, because of the pandemic, we've seen a, a uh, escalated departure doing from the, the resignation, you know, the quiet resignation, if you will, that everybody is, is kind of using that term. Uh, but you've got people rolling out for the retirement. You've got some leaving just because they're just they're, they're burned out uh, within the healthcare, whether they be from the clinical standpoint or the administrative side, as I, as I just mentioned in the business office. So it, that in itself, from a rural standpoint, is really making a huge impact, negative impact on the rural space. And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir with the, those that, that are on this this session. Because uh, you live and breathe it every day, right? Uh, we don't. We just we see it when we talk to our folks, or we go phys physically out to those facilities. But um, uh, it, it's it's making a great impact. And, I, and I've got some more commentary I'll add here in, in a little bit. You know, Julie, go ahead, please. Uh, another another slide that this really uh, I think gives you a visual uh, of the impact uh, of the staffing levels. Um, and and again, nursing being the, the biggest. Uh, uh, impacted area of it. And, you know, I, I know, I think Chris is going to get into this, but I, you know, I'll throw it out there, kind of uh, prop him up here a little bit. But as all of you have seen, the the impact and the cost, you know, labor cost is, is the biggest thing you have in healthcare. And so when the nurses started leaving and started traveling because they could make more money, they left these local community hospitals in a bind. One, because they didn't have the coverage. Two, if if for that hospital to be, if you will, stay sustainable with what they were providing from a care standpoint, it was costing that hospital minimally 25, if not 30 percent more to have that person, that nurse on staff. Uh, and, and so, you know, and I say that to kind of lead to some service providers out there that in that space of nurse and physician staffing kind of taking advantage of the, of that, of that environment that we've been in the last, uh, you know, two years. But, but again, uh, nursing is just the tip of it physicians. And again, this depicts, you know, it even drills down into the dental side of, of healthcare, right? We're not talking just hospital, but all of healthcare has been impacted uh, greatly in the, certainly the last two years. Go ahead, Julie. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, um, go ahead. Yeah, you go ahead, Julie. Yeah, um, basically, we wanted to know has has the pandemic caused this? You know, and as Clint just showed us with his slides in the past, this has been going on for a while. The pandemic just helped to um, exacerbate the problem that we already had. But really, just as Clint just indicated, burnout and fatigue have plagued the front lines, and that includes not only our nurses 
but our frontline workers, our patient access folks, um, people in patient financial services, in accounting, every department is suffering. How do you feel this has happened? Um, or what have you seen, Chris, in your daily um, work? Yeah, I've seen a, a lot of folks that have survived this last two years of the COVID component, uh, maybe two and a half years, and, uh, and are exhausted. They've been overworked frequently um, because it couldn't cover staff or even because existing staff got COVID. So that impacted them as well. And I think what we're facing is you've seen kind of people get numb to the fact that they've had agency folks come in to back them up. The agency people came in, were short-lived, got paid more, and they left. And so it left them now with the, you know, holding the staff again. Um, in some cases, agencies, uh, specifically nursing, traveling nursing folks came into a state and then when they left, um, they just moved on to another state. So now there was a vacuum of empty spaces to fill. And, and I think it, it was kind of a double whammy. You know, first off, you paid more. Uh, secondly, you, you got your staff brought down to the fact that somebody else got paid but left. And I'm still yeah. here working extra hours. So uh, really was, you know, turning uh, really excited employees into exhausted people who are just doing uh, grinding through the job. So that's been what I've seen. Yeah, you know, Chris, and, 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 and again, that feeds into kind of my previous comment about, you know, you've got just natural attrition, right, because of retirement. But some of that attrition really ramped up because of what you just said, right? They're just purely exhausted, burned out, and, and, and we're done with health care. Um, it just wasn't fun anymore, right? And, uh, and not to say that it was fun, but, but you, you know what I'm saying. It, it just really um, exacerbated the situation. And, and, and through that, hospitals of, of we've seen it we read it every day that hospitals are cutting back on on services because what you just said chris we, you know you've, you've got the loss of, of the clinical side right so now you're not doing inpatients now you're you got hospitals cutting out labor and delivery well my concern is is okay in that rural community space how are you supporting your localized patients when it comes to i mean there's still going to be births, right? There's still going to be needs. Where, where is that local community going to get their service, right? And this is part of the sustainable real community. How do, how do we, you know, certainly we don't sit here and have the answers to it, you know, but, uh, but the point being is how do you address it? How, what's going on? How do you address in that community and, 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 and supporting that community as a real community hospital if you're having to cut services and, and, and now the patient is having to drive 100 miles, 150 miles, whatever it may be to to get those services. I mean, so it's a, uh, I use the word trickle down effect, but it, it, it is, it's a trickle down effect of what's going on um, out there. And um, I'm not sure anybody has the has the answers. I know the government has, has put together programs um, to try to um, keep, you know, from a revenue stream, keep some of these hospitals uh, afloat with the quit programs and the, and the, uh, uh, what low volume adjustment programs and you know now where's that going to go the medicare dependent hospital group has this enhanced low volume adjustment program you know but where where is that going to go is that going to maintain forever and that's kind of a rhetorical question chris i'll kind of just throw that to you because you, you this is kind of you're into that side of things but so these governmental programs do you see those being sustainable for a long period or do you think those will uh, readjust now that uh, now that supposedly we're run, coming out of this pandemic so i'll, I'll throw that to you I think the government programs that, you know, we utilized heavy amounts of funding during the COVID is, is diminishing, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, I did talk to several leaders in the community, uh, specifically critical access hospital leaders, and uh, their answer was, you know, in some cases, there are grants um, and loans out there. The grants take quite a lot of effort to apply for, and in most cases, the critical access hospitals don't have extra resources to put on a grant. Uh, application project. Um, and then the loan component is a challenge because most of the loans that the hospitals are being offered up now require the hospital to provide 55% of the total oh. value up front. And so many of the hospitals, number one, if they have the 55%, don't want to give up that reserve. It's sure. you know, kind of a safety net or a parachute. And number two, a lot of them just don't have it. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it kind of pushes them out. And to your point, Clint, uh, you know, if we're we're in a situation where people are having to drive for healthcare yeah. and it could be anywhere from one to three hours. Um, there are a lot of these rural communities where people don't have a car and yeah, no. you know, we don't even have a solution to get them there. So it becomes really um, only in a 
acute care situation, such as a car wreck or something we can justify care flight. And I, I don't see, you know, people utilizing uh, healthcare for daily checkups via helicopter. No, so no, I no. That, that, I yeah, I didn't, think, I didn't think about that. You know, we kind of sometimes individually and myself take advantage, of, you know, take it for granted our situation because I live in an urban area, right? I live in the Dallas Fort Worth area and I have within a two and a half mile of my house, I've got a, I've got a clinic or, you know, hospital supported clinic and, and ER. Um, and so I don't think about that from my own personal viewpoint, but you're absolutely right. So yeah, well, Julie, to the, the leaders that I reached out to uh, in anticipation of this presentation. And then my question was, you know, how are you surviving? What are you doing? And obviously we have been working on cost control for five, 10 years in healthcare. Sure. I don't think there's much more constraints we can put on, uh, on healthcare, frankly, w without causing patient care issues. But there were some things that some of the leaders recommended, such as telemedicine. If you obviously, if you create new revenue streams, that helps and reduce the expense side at the same time, then you get your profitability back. So telemedicine was one, pain management was one, chronic care management was another, pulmonary rehab and geriatric psych, which are great, but there are two things you have to remember. All these programs have an upfront cost. So they're going to impact the cost until we get reimbursement. And then in several of these programs, they're tied to the Medicare cost report. So it could be anywhere from nine months to a year before it impacts your bottom line. Even though you may be profitable, you may not get that significant benefit until the cost report is impacted. So yeah, that, um, that's a, that's a, option. that's a great point. Yeah, no, great, great point. And, and I, you know, I'm, Julie and I were on a call yesterday and, you know, I think the hospitals uh, need to, look internally to see what they have already within the four walls, let's say, right, that they can optimize better than what they may be optimizing for, for mm -hmm. a, a better word. And, uh, and, and that came across in a, a discussion we were having with a, 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 another group about utilization of the lab. And, mm -hmm. and there's ways to, to utilize, you know, improve that process, improve revenue in that. Now, granted, it's, you know, lab's a lab and you're going to get some revenue, but it's not, I don't know if it's, it'll save a hospital, but it, but it, again, it, it does increase some revenue. So those are things out there that I think some of hosp, you know, hospitals are going to have to look at within their four walls. What can they optimize that's, that's sitting there as an asset, right? So. Excellent. Thank you. You know, then we're going to go into this picture is worth a thousand words right here. Oh yeah. Yeah. Julie, I, I, when you shared this with me, it, it really, it impact me and, and, and why, and here's why. I lived in West Texas for a number of years and, and traveled extensively all of, up through the panhandle. And I did see some of this. And I'm talking back back in the 90s, back in the early 2000s, we were, I was, we were seeing some of this. Certainly it's grown and, and expanded since, but hospitals closing and, and again, impacting the, the local community. Um, and, and it just breaks my heart to see that this is happening. I was actually at an event uh, uh, a torch event last week, Texas Organization of Real Community Hospitals down in Austin and talking to a few CFOs I knew. And, and we were talking about these kind of things. And and I'm telling you, there, there's some whether they're talking about it at the conference or just, in you know, within themselves when they're at these events, there's a real concern out there with, with these yeah. CFOs and CEOs of where where they're going and, and, and what they're going to look like in the next six months or year. Uh, so yeah. this this is a telling telling visual. So I yeah, yes. it's you know it's interesting too because it's not only our small rural hospitals but our community hospitals are suffering as well. And also in Becker's yesterday, did you see where Centura in Colorado is laying off one percent of its workforce? Mm. Um, I didn't see that piece, but I did see Ohio. Uh, hospital in Ohio, uh, St. Vincent's is laying off 978 employees. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's just um, mass, mass right now, but we've got some solutions and we, we're going to get to that in a little bit, but I just wanted to um, bring this, this picture up. It's just, it's such an impactful yeah. picture. It really um, made me stop and think for sure. You know, 41 in rural hospitals are at risk of closing service, closing or losing services, just like Clint said. You know, I was uh, at a, a KHAM meeting here in California, and a couple of the hospitals were talking that they were going to cut their ED hours down. So all of this is putting hospitals at risk. 
we have 2,176 rural hospitals in the country. That's a lot of hospitals. Yeah. And how are we going to keep those open? Well, it, 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 it is tough, you know, and again, I'll revert back to uh, a document I got from the president of Torch, but uh, he recently presented uh, in Washington, um, you know, the state of Texas, if you will, from a rural community aspect. And, you know, he was he shared some information with me, but, you know, staffing is roughly 60 percent of all hospitals total expenses. Right. So we've already talked about labor and supply expenses are up. Travel nurses, that cost is going up now. You know, the government's coming in trying to change some, you know, put some laws in place to kind of limit that and put that back in uh, in, a, in a right perspective. Um, uh, but, you know, you got reappropriation of American Rescue Plan Act funds. And, you know, that's two billion was allocated to Texas Department of State Health Service to support hospitals. You know, so, you know, that's that's helpful. But but that's just part of the solution. Right. right. Um, exactly. Especially when you've got all the increase of, of, of cost of doing business. Um, you know, and it, it, it talks about the burnout we've mentioned. I mean, this program, it really kind of hits home with what we, everything we said. Um, Definitely. But, you know, they're trying to implement programs. And Chris, you, you, you read this as well as Julie does, too. You know, they're trying to put lower the uh, some of the requirements from a nursing standpoint to get more nurses in, in, into the program faster. Right. And get them get them in and get them out. Um, you know, the repayment assistance program for nursing uh, programs physician education loan repayment programs. There's a lot of things the state of Texas is, is doing to, to help curb this as fast as we can. But, but again, it, and it, I, don't, I don't sit here and try to be Debbie Downer on everything I'm saying. It, it, we all see it and we read it. And, and, and certainly y'all out in, the, out in your hospital, respective hospitals are feeling it every day. And uh, I, I read it and know how I feel about reading it. I'm not living it every day. So it, it's, uh, it can be very daunting. So. I just wanted to add that. Speaking of somebody that lives it every day, I'm sure that Mike Cooper does, your CEO friend at um, Rush County. Chris? Yeah. yeah, so thank you, Julie. So, you know, I reached out to several of our clients in different areas, uh, specifically critical access hospital, rural regional hospitals. And um, although the overarching theme is staffing and supply costs are increasing and the impact uh it was interesting by state that each state had a different perspective on it, um, the staffing component. In Kansas, when I was talking to Mike, uh, specifically, there was a concern of, among the Kansas hospitals around the inflationary direction that staffing and supply costs are going. And the comment that was made is once you stretch the sweater out, you can't get it back to its original shape. And the implication being that once these prices have been inflated, they're never going to go back to what they were before. So nursing lab, rad, all that. In Kansas, they're available to get them through agencies, but again, they're paying a higher cost. Um, and then the other concern that the Kansas hospitals voc uh, vocalized was attrition. And they had a significant increase of attrition. Um, their state rate was about 20% per annum, and it's already gone to 30% this, this, wow. this year. Wow. And a concern that they had specifically voiced was a lack of continuity care. I think Clinton mentioned some of that earlier, but you know, as you're turning people over, frequently you're dealing with um, training costs. And so right. you've now brought that cost up. Um, you've also got friction with existing staff who are constantly having to retrain the incoming folks because that churn is so high. And so it's impacting patient care in an indirect and direct way. Um, and interestingly enough, that was Kansas, but in Florida, the commentary that I received around staffing, and I think, you know, Clint, you mentioned that turnover was incredibly um, impactful in Florida. Uh, now they're just dealing with, okay, so I'm having to deal with it. What am I doing to move forward? And specifically in Florida, they were concerned about the fact that they just can't get resources in rural areas. So they don't have trained people and they don't have credentialed people. And, and that's causing significant impact. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I add, can I add to that, Chris? Sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, it's, I had a conversation with, again, a CFO about two or three weeks ago. And he was explaining to me, concerned about what where he's going because he where he's at, he's got uh, within a, a, his county and one surround, he's got ten thousand lives okay, well, to to pull from to for for employment. Now, as we all know, predominantly in these rural spaces, your 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 community is based off of their Medicare folks, right? They're they're older, they're not maybe looking for jobs, and so he he's only got ten thousand to begin with lives to pull from. Uh, from a skill set, and then you've got even more limited skill set because of, of the aged population in those communities. So that's double whammy, right? 
Uh, sure. So it, it talks to what you just kind of mentioned. It's it's finding having access to the skill set, but even um, having in a qualified skill set. And I talked to another one this morning that he's finding he's in a little better market space, but he you know he's finding some younger folks that are willing and have the 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 willingness to to learn healthcare. Um, uh, and we're talking administrative type stuff. But uh, so again, it's all. It can be really good in one area and really bad in some other areas, as we all know, right? It's all about logistics, kind of like real estate. <laughs> location, yeah. location, location. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> and in, in another state I looked at, I talked to some people in Arkansas, and they have a uh, partnership that works with all the critical and rural uh, hospitals, uh, critical access hospitals and rural regionals. And um, that partnership obviously works together to get funding when they can. They've got some state funding, but it's been limited but they did an evaluation year over year between 2020 and 2021 on just cost. And so staffing costs were evaluated in nursing and radiology lab and respiratory therapy. And the increases for those hospitals that were measured ranged from 9.43% to 28% increase in staffing costs. And, and I think you kind of touched on this earlier, Clint. So if, if 60% of your cost is labor, Right. And you just now increase that by 10 to 28 percent. And you already were running at anywhere from one to three percent margin, which is probably a good critical access hospital these days. You've eaten into your margin significantly, and that's not a sustainable model. Right. So it's interesting that everybody had staffing concerns, but they all had different staffing concerns focused. Um, the Arkansas group also turned all this information into um, their legislature. So hopefully they'll get some assistance there. But um, same overarching theme, different angles to the same. Right, level. right. No, I, yeah, and I, you know, certainly each state has their associations that that support them, right? And 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 taking things to the uh, local and national uh, legislation to try to implement things to 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 maintain sustainability, right? It's important. So, exactly. Well, thank you. You bet. You know, there was a McKenzie survey that just said, you know, what's driving this. Um, leaving of the nurses. And it's basically paycheck, lack of support are the top factors, but there's also a report about mental health in our healthcare workers. And the 988 number that just came out, the suicide and mental health um, hotline, I just heard on the news today, it, it is just, they cannot believe how many calls they're getting. Wow. So it's, it's really interesting. You know, and I, I just to go back to what you both just reiterated um, that, you know, how do you get talent to stay in the community without that turnover? It's a, it's a great uh, well, question. Yeah. You know, that, that's, and, and not just from a nursing standpoint, but, you know, Everybody. because of, because, because of what the pandemic has really um, shown us right. once we got through the initial onslaught of it is we all had to convert to remote access right, right. Uh, and and that has shown folks that they they they've got more options and i say folks the local community they've got they've got options because now they don't they cannot work for xyz hospital in their local community because someone's willing to hire them and i'll just pick on where we live dallas fort worth where i live you know they can work for a bigger health system with more pay and maybe better benefits do it remotely if they're just a biller right so i mean there's competing a lot of competing things now that have cropped up because of the pandemic. And so that makes it even harder for the local community hospital to exactly. stay competitive from a, a, a pay scale. So. Oh, absolutely. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Uh, this slide here. Yeah, I, I, I like this one, too. You know, Julie, you and I talked about this the other day. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a real visual, you know, I call it an infograph of, of kind of where things are. And this was put out in 2013. World uh, World Health Organization, but you know, I mean, the numbers are just mind blowing to me. And, and again, this was 2013, and those numbers haven't dropped as we've been talking about ad nauseum here. But uh, again, a good depiction of what's going on. It just kind of, to me, hits you in the face uh, of what's happening. So, definitely. Here we go again, just to reiterate. You know, the the mental health is a, are atop the list of patient safety concerns because. If your staff is having some, you know, depression or anxiety, something like, you know, this is going to affect what's happening on your front lines and in your, in your room, you know, your patient care. It's, it's very, um, it's, it's a sad state of affairs, but luckily we have the resources to help individuals with mental health issues. 
And then again, you know, the, the staffing pay and lack of support. Um, I don't know if you have anything that you want to add to this, but. Well, I, I do. Uh, you know, I, I, our own company, um, we're, you know, good size, a global company, but we, we have, uh, we've had support, but we're recently rolled out a bigger panel of support for this mental, you know, stress that people may be going through to yes. make available to our own team, uh, team members across U.S. And, and and such to have access to have those conversations. If you have some anxiety and and, and stress is going on, um, and and I'm, you know, talk again, talking to the folks I talk to out in the business, it's it's uh, that's happening in a lot of, um, uh, be it outsourcing firms, be it, you know, hospitals, healthcare providers, you're, they're putting those plans in place to support their team. And I, I think that's extremely important to know. I do too. Definitely. I think it's huge. Um, and, you know, let's end the stigma there, you know, as they say, um, but switching, switching into, you know, what are the options to maintain sustainability? And I'm going to let Clint talk a little yeah. bit about this on, other viable options. Yeah. Yeah. So everybody attending, you know, look, there's, to me, there's always options, you know, everything we go through typically is, is a, it's a short-term scenario. Typically short-term be it could be a week, could be a year, could be two years as we're experiencing now, but, but there are options out there to help you stay sustainable. And, and, and it could be, you know, finding that an outsourcing partner, uh, that you wouldn't have thought of before to support you from from the ED staffing, the nurse staffing, as we talked about. Um, then you get into looking for a, a outsourcing partner to help from a, a coding standpoint. And you've probably done some of this already. And, and as I've talked to, to Julie and Chris before internally, you know, we most hospitals are very familiar with outsourcing because it uh, the cost of things. Right. So they, they've already outsourced cafeteria. They've outsourced cleaning. Uh, and, and such. And certainly that has all been uh, even more done so since the pandemic. Um, but but you have options out there. And and again, outsourcing may not have been on the scope a year ago, two years ago, but today it is because, of, again, as we talked about, lack of skill set, loss of staffing and, and such. So what do you look for in an outsourcing partner? You know, it, it, that's um, I have my opinion, obviously, as, as we do here. Uh, but um, you know, to me, you want to look for a partner that is scalable. Uh, I think a partner that that has um, different um, um, segments of the rev cycle, if you will, within healthcare that they can help support you. Uh, someone that can be flexible, that can flex up because uh, the change your your need could change tomorrow. Then uh, that's different than today. So you need somebody that can flex up. We do flex down. Um, as I talked to a CFO, COO this morning is you know, he, he's been able to find a, a couple of folks here in the last three or four months. And he's looking to bring some his outsourcing stuff that he had back in house. Uh, but you need a partner that can help you do that. Right. And make that transition. Um, you know, you want to get with a group that that and, and I'll, I'll, Chris, Chris handles our consulting division. So Chris can come out. And, and this is no obligation to utilize what we do at Health Recon because we're here to be of service to, to, to you folks in the community and offer up, you know, uh, things you can do, the best, um, you know, what the processes. So that's Chris is to go out and kind of help you assess where do you need, what needs to be maybe look to be outsourced, what can be insourced, what makes sense, doesn't make sense. You know, where's your revenue gains? That's a lot what Chris does and, and, and Julie and I do it kind of on a, on a high level. But those are things you want to look at a company that can provide you those types of resources to to help identify areas that of concern and how do you address them to maintain sustainability. Um, you know, cost containment. Chris goes has talked about that, and certainly uh, we've talked about the experience skill set. You know, improve the cash flow. So you know, we kind of talked about you know, look in your own four walls. What do you have that that can uh, you maybe not being totally utilized, it can increase cash flow, right? Um, patient satisfaction, that's big. It's, it was big before the pandemic, it's even bigger now um, because your local community is maybe not being uh, able to be uh, healthcare-wise serviced to the level they once were because again, you're, 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 you're down on staff, you've, you've quit doing elective surgeries, you've had to, uh, as I stated, do, not do labor and delivery anymore. So, 
improve patient satisfaction. So, you know, get with somebody and help you talk through that, you know, help market to your local community of some of your new services um, to get them to come back to your, in, in your four walls, if you will. Uh, increase efficiency, productivity, you know, as we say in the quality of care, of course, that goes hand in hand with your, your availability to uh, physicians, specialty physicians, and, and your nursing. Um, so again, this is not totally to highlight us, if you will, but those are things that we believe you need to look at and, and consider as you continue to move forward to maintain sustainability in your community. Uh, again, this is uh, kind of indicative to kind of what I just spoke about, your different um, segments of rev cycle that can be looked at that maybe you haven't looked at previously. And, and certainly these are things that, that we provide, uh, but there are other companies, we know you have options out there and, and, and you need to do your due diligence and, and when you're looking and talking to folks about potential things, but your pre-service, your billing, your posting. Posting is really kind of, uh, to me, a new area that wasn't once an, a concern or issue, uh, but we assist in the, the accounting department to help cover uh, someone that may, was accounts payable person uh, that has moved and transferred because of a, the husband or the, you know, the significant other got a better paying job in an urban area, so they've left. So how do you fill that slot with a, an accounting person? May not be readily available. Well, we can help do that on a short-term basis. Um, and then in the other bucket collections, you know, talking about denials, helping improve the denial process, uh, insurance collections appeals, as you see there, uh, and then the patient services. Um, so again, this depicts an all-encompassing global end-to-end um, offering from a, from a company like Health Recon. And again, there, there's others out there that, um, that can do pretty much the same, some parts not as much, uh, but those are things you need to look at. Um, Chris or Julie, y'all want to add anything to that? I think, I think it's important to note that, you know, cash acceleration was list, listed there. We have mm -hmm. a pretty robust analytics tool under the collections component. Um, and, and we use that tool to look at root cause analysis and resolve claim issues before they happen. So my advice would be, uh, you know, if you're looking for services in the marketplace, look for a, a partner that has some analytic engine that can assist right. you in accelerating your cash. Exactly. Yeah, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point, you know, and Julie is, um, Julie's really getting a lot of attention within that realm of things. And, and uh, you know, certainly there are some EMR systems that hospitals are using today that provide some form of that potentially. Uh, uh, but this There's is just all right there. Yeah. Yeah. So. You know, the, the really nice thing about our dashboard, it, it gives you um, information pretty much real time on inpatient, outpatient ED statistics. Um, you can take a look at your accounts receivables. You can look at the payers. You know, what's the revenue? What's what have you collected? What's outstanding um, trends, different trends and analysis, denial analysis, root cause. Um, you can really delve in to see what the root cause is. And it's it's really a wonderful tool. Um, I'm, I'm very proud of it, actually. And just the different KPIs, um, claims, uh, accounts receivable, denials, et cetera, just, you know, this is a, a great tool of ours. It's an AI tool and um, uh, it works right with your, your hospital's uh, information system. So whether you're on Meditech, Epic, Cerner, it, it definitely interfaces with those. There, hey, there's a question. There's a question here that, uh, sure. to, Chris, to Chris, but, you know, evaluating outsourcing, you know, is it the question, is it more expensive to, could it be more expensive to outsource? Um, Chris? Yeah. Well, I, hi, this is Chris. Yeah, so I, I don't see it more expensive um, because you're not, in most cases, the contract would be contingency. Mm -hmm. And so that means that if the vendor doesn't perform, the vendor doesn't get paid. So it drives cash into the facility. Um, whereas some of the things I've seen is facilities are carrying FTEs that are fully loaded with a lot of uh, benefit cost. Mm -hmm. And that productivity and quality may not be happening or may not be measured inside the hospital. So that's one of the advantages of the vendor component is they're motivated um, to get your cash in the door for the hospital so that they get their part of it. And, no, that, uh, I, think I think that's, that's, that's key. key. That's key. And I, you know, in my 34 years, I'm going to say 99% of what I've uh, been providing from a service standpoint has been, like you say, that skin in the game, that contingency right. based program um, um, that, yeah, 
we we as a service provider, any service provider, we want to we want to cover our our base level, our cost, right? So that means we we're motivated with that program to to make sure that that hospital and that client is successful. If they're successful, we're successful, and otherwise, it's it's not it's, it's not a win, right? And, and I think the other the other comment I'd have is you know people about ten years ago were concerned about going offshore. The world is a global entity now. And, and almost all your credit cards are managed offshore, your customer service for your phone, everything yeah. else. Um, so I'm not so much concerned about outsourcing offshore anymore. It seems to be the norm. And it actually sometimes gives leverage on that pricing component. Well, that's, so, that's a good point. That's, and, 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 that, and I'd failed to mention that, that, you know, you're right. There, there are a lot more um, companies out there that are utilizing, whether, whether the hospitals know or not, this offshore type uh um, processing, you know, but that's another thing to look at is, okay, is there uh, the components? Is it onshore, offshore, nearshore? You know, is there a hybrid model of that? And those are things I think you would ask uh, you, you folks that are on the, on the call, but that would be something I'd ask is, you know, what is your utilization of onshore, offshore, nearshore? And of course, all of that, if it's all, all onshore, the cost basis goes up a little bit, as we know. Um, right. If it's a hybrid, then you can, it makes it a little more flexible. And if it's offshore, it's even, you know, even more of a um, uh, beneficial leverage for, for everybody involved. And the beauty of it is you can utilize our tool to make sure that you, you're you seeing everything that's happening as well. Great. Good question. Um, Thank you, audience. Any other questions, Clint? No, I didn't see anything else pop up. Okay. Um, this just talks about um, the services that we have. We have, you know, la we're in the laboratory space. We have 267 labs. Um, we have 57 imaging um, uh, clients. We have uh, 61 facilities that includes ambulatory surgery, surgery centers, hospitals, and medical health systems. And then we have 251 providers. So that would be surgeons. That would be small physician groups to large physician groups. Anything you want to add there, Clint? No, no. I just, you know, again, this is really to depict not just what we do and all that, but, but, Again, for folks to give them a kind of a visual of what to look for out there with other companies yeah. that they may be considering. Um, um, you know, 30 years ago, you, you you may have had 10 different service providers, right? Right. For providing support for some of these things. Today, because of the way the market mergers, acquisitions, and just uh, the way things have progressed, now you you, you can condense that down and, and um have one or two vendors that supply and support you in a way it makes them more accountable. It gives you leverage from a pricing standpoint. Um, and you're managing, um, you know, one or two heads instead of 15 and, and, and eliminates that point in the finger that, well, I didn't perform because I didn't get this information from this group or whatever the case may be. So again, this is just a depiction of kind of who we are and, and maybe some things you could look at and as you're evaluating where you go. And Clint, I hate to ask you to do this again because I'm like, <laughs> I, if you could talk about a little bit about our clinical product. Yeah. So again, this is was derived because of our, our background as a as a global provider. We have a, a lot of educated CPA uh, folks that are near shore, offshore that can help from a remote basis uh, at a lot lower cost to support uh, any hospital of any size within their accounts payable area. Uh, we actually can be, as you see here, virtual CFO, and it can be a flexible engagement, um, and it just, you know, easy, ease of access, uh, cost basis is extremely low, a lot cheaper than what you can get on a localized level with uh, accredited uh, teams supporting you. Um, and again, this just kind of depicts those areas uh, uh, within the accounting framework of, of what can, what we can support. Um, and, and again, it's not, anything that we show up here is not a all in, all or nothing type uh, menu. It's it's this is built as a as a, a boutique type service providing you know opportunity here. We we want you to pick and choose what is your need and 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 we build that within your framework. Uh, and, and again, that'd be something I would look at too. There are some firms out there that will say, okay, you've got there's no picking and choosing. It's it's all or none, right? Well, I I. I I'm against that type of mindset. This is, we are a service company. We're here to be of service to you, to fit your needs, you not fit ours. And, and so these are just areas that depict where we can support you um, in various shapes and forms. Thank you, Clint. 
So we are an end-to-end revenue cycle management company, but we also have this accounting services uh, as well. So we're, we're pretty um, robust in that regard. You know, I, I really want to say um, on behalf of Clint and Chris and myself, we want to thank you and we appreciate you taking the valuable time today to spend some time with us, learning a little bit about sustainability for the rural and community hospitals, taking a look at some statistics and background of uh, Chris and Clint and myself, um, bring you some maybe some education things that you might have not known um, and then also kind of help you maybe make some decisions in the future. If there's anything that we can do to help you, please reach out to myself or Clint and our contact information is here. We'd be happy to send you a copy of the deck or um, uh, just let us know, just send us an, a note. And um, if there are any questions, let us know before we close out. Yeah, there will be a copy of this recording available. Uh, typically, we get it out out there uh, within the next probably couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, so you'll have that available to you. Uh, and again, we approach you. So Chris is our chief consulting officer, as you mentioned. But we each take our our jobs from a cons- consultative. I can't even talk. Uh, consultative approach It is really we're here to answer your questions, give you our insight with experience that we have in the in, in the industry. And, you know, if we can't help you, that is okay. We know people that can, and we're more than happy to make those introductions to get you in a, in a, in a situation that is beneficial to you and your community. Yes, we definitely and I would also say it. to the audience real quick, Clint, is uh, we are available to you if you want us to come present at your professional organization. Oh, absolutely. No, that's a good point. Feel free to call on us anytime. We do that frequently. Yeah. Yes. Definitely Julie, agree. thank you so much. Chris, thank you. Thank you Thanks, everyone. everybody. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.